So continuing with the notes, um, let's get started. Um, one of the things that uh, we're going to be doing today is mostly just definitions, so we're going to go through it pretty quickly. I will be assigning some of the Bozeman videos over the types of solids, uh, so that will help also explain it a little bit further. So we're going to go through this as quickly as possible. Um, first of all, we have two types of solids. We have amorphous solids and crystalline solids. And as you can read from the definitions, uh, the basic difference is one is very ordered, such as the crystalline, and amorphous is very disordered. And usually they're like long chain molecules twisted up kind of like plastics and asphalt are an example of that. Um, we have our lattice in our solids, which is a 3D system of points designating the centers. They can be atoms, ions, or molecules. Uh, and then we have the unit cell, which is the smallest repeating unit of the lattice. You do not have to memorize these, but you do need to be aware of them. We have a simple cube, a body-centered cube, and a face-centered cube. And it's just the way that it is put together. And there's three examples of polonium, uranium, and gold metal. Again, you don't have to memorize those, but you should be aware of them. Your coordination number is uh, the na uh, number of nearest neighbors surrounding a particle in a crystal. So if you have particle size that's the same, but you have a higher coordination number, that means there are more particles packed into that given volume of a crystal. You have X-ray diffraction, which is how we can determine the uh, crystal structure. And basically, you send an X-rays of a single wavelength, into the crystal and uh, the x-rays are scattered by it and it produces that diffraction pattern which is how we can determine the crystal structure. Uh, the types of crystalline solids, we have ionic solids such as sodium chloride, magnesium chloride, um, magnesium uh, oxide would also be a an ionic solid um, and they're of course held together by those uh, coulombic forces which by now hopefully is beaten into your brain of how to determine the strength of that. We have molecular solids such as sucrose um, and they have molecules at lattice points and of course they're held together by LDFs, dipole-dipole and or hydrogen bonding if that is present in the molecular solid. We have metallic solids like gold and of course they're metal cations and uh, at the lattice points and they're of course held together by metallic bonds, which we will revisit here in a second. We have atomic solids like argon. Um, of course, you'd have to be at a very, very, very low temperature and very, very high pressure to get that to happen, but they would be held together by those LDFs because remember, LDFs are the only thing that happen on nonpolar and they're the only thing that happen on the noble gases. Then you have your covalent network, which is essentially basically a giant molecule and they are um, held together by covalent bonds, of course, but they have an atom at each lattice point held together by additional covalent bonds. So they're essentially just a giant molecule, and there we have diamond and silicon and graphite. Your group 14, or 4A, whichever way you want to call it, carbon and silicon especially, uh, tend to be the ones that are covalent network solids. So you should know that for a test or for the AP exam, that graphite and, I mean, Carbon and uh, silica tend to form those covalent network solids, which make them very, very strong. Uh, the properties of solid, of course, depends on the nature of the forces that hold them together. Then we have metallic crystals, um, which are non-directional covalent bonding, and they um, are packed in together and equally bonded to each other, and we, of course, call that held together by metallic bonds. So bonding in metals is strong and non-directional. Um, the atoms are very difficult to separate, but they're easy to move, which is why we can do things like hammer them into a thin sheet or pull them into a wire, because I can move them around, but it's hard to separate them. Uh, two models are used to describe metallic bonding, and they are the electron C model, which is the one that we're most familiar with, and that is the simplest model, and that is the metal cations are in a sea of valence electrons. Of course, they can conduct heat and electricity, and the cations can be moved around easily. Again, that's where we get those classic metallic properties like uh, malleability and ductile and electrical con conductivity. Here we have the electron C model, and you see they're just kind of floating around with all the electrons surrounding them. 
And then we have something a little bit more complicated, and that is called the band model or the molecular orbital model, MO. And this is more detailed. The electrons are assumed to travel around the metal crystal in molecular orbitals, which are formed by the valence atomic orbitals of the metal. These uh, molecular orbitals that result um, are very closely spaced energy levels, and they form like a continuous band. Okay, And some of the molecular orbitals are empty, and then mobile electrons get excited, and then they go into those empty orbitals, and then they're free to move throughout the metal crystal. So it's a little bit more complicated than the electron C model. We obviously don't teach the band model in pre-AP. So here's that, what that looks like. We have some magnesium atoms. Um, of course, the 12 is the number of protons uh, in the nucleus. And so then you're showing that you have those empty. So we're, it, of course, magnesium fills the 3s2 with its electrons. But then you have that 3p available, which they can get excited and jump around and move around up there. Uh, metal alloy are substances that contain a mixture of elements and ha they have their metallic properties. So things like um, brass and stainless steel and bronze are examples. Uh, when we did the penny lab last year, in, or in Chem 1 when you were a sophomore, uh, that was where we made the, we plated the penny with copper. We ha had a copper penny, we plated it with zinc, and then we heated it up and we basically made uh, brass. Um, and so that's, that was a metal alloy. There are two types of metal alloys that we need to talk about. I uh, think we might be doing a pogle on this. There's a substitutional al alloy, which basically some of the host metals are replaced by similar metals, meaning similar size. Uh, example would be brass and, and uh, stirring silver and pu pewter. So if you look at the where they're located on the periodic table, copper and zinc are right next to each other, so they have a similar size. So they're basically just substituting um, some of the copper with zinc to make it uh, less likely to oxidize. Then you have interstitial alloys, and they're a little different because basically the space that are left um, with the, between the atoms are filled with much smaller atoms. Okay. So you would expect, because we're filling the empty space between the atoms, that the density of an interstitial um, alloy is higher than the substitutional, subs, I can't say that, substitutional alloy. I'm not going to even try again. And so an example of this would be steel. And so we put carbon uh, in there with iron because iron has the propensity to very easily oxidize and rust. And so by putting carbon in those spots, it kind of... Uh, provides a barrier, and so it's less likely to uh, rust, which is why we use stainless steel in all our building materials instead of just straight iron. Um, that brings us to the network solids, which are uh, atomic solids with strong directional covalent bonds. They are brittle and don't conduct heat or electricity. And so also carbon and silicon show up. They are the strongest type of bonding, the covalent network solids, strongest type of bonding. Uh, allotropes, that's something that came up earlier on one of our uh, units, and if you recall, they are different forms of the same element, and so uh, diamond, graphite, and Buckminster fullerene, I promise you that's not a made-up word, uh, we call them BF BMFs for short, and they are all allotropes of carbon. Uh, sulfur and phosphorus both have uh, allotropes as well. Uh, you can have white phosphorus, uh, you can have phosphorus that glows in the dark when it burns and the other form doesn't, so there are different forms of that as well. But they are all still the same element. They just behave differently because of the way they're bonded together. Um, the diamond uh, has a tetrahedral sp3 arrangement. Its molecular orbitals are far apart in energy, thus no conduction of electricity. So there's an example of the way that they're bonded together. They have that tetrahedral arrangement when they're bonded to each other. Graphite is an sp2 arrangement, and it has six-member rings, um, and they have pi molecular orbitals allow it to conduct electricity. Uh, and it has strong bonding within its layers, and we can convert graphite to diamond at a pressure of about 150,000 atmosphere and a temperature of 2,800 degrees Celsius. Um, so the reason that graphite 
the layers, the reason it's so soft and we use it as pencil lead is because the layers basically slough off is kind of what they do. So here we have the molecular orbital energies in diamond, which is the first one, and the, in a typical metal. So you can see they're really far apart in diamond. Uh, silicon or silicon uh, compounds are to geology what we think of carbon compounds are, are to biology. Okay, they're the most important, and they contain uh, silicon and oxygen. Uh, silica, which is silicon dioxide, is the fundamental uh, compound. Quartz and some types of sand are silica, and it is a network of SiO4 tetrahedra. Of course, the bonds are uh, 3p orbitals are too big. And then the, uh, the silicates are anions of Si and O. And that's what that looks like when they're arranged together. Um, glass is formed when we melt silica and then cool it very rapidly. Um, other substances are added to glass to vary its property. We call glass an amorphous solid and can be called a supercooled liquid. Um, ceramics contain tiny uh, crystals of silica in glassy cement is what that is. And then here is quartz crystals and quartz glass. So you can see the difference. A quartz crystal is much more ordered, whereas quartz glass has things substituted in there. And that brings us to semiconductors. Uh, which is elemental silicon. Uh, semiconductors are important, of course, because that's all in our electronics. Um, I'm going to let you read through that, um, but they have basically the same structure as diamond, but the energy gap is closer together, and then we have a few electrons that can skip across this gap, which makes them a great semiconductor. Um, at higher temperatures, where more energy is available to excite the electron, the conductivity of silicon increases. Okay. Most metals have decreased conductivity at higher temperatures, but silicon increases. Uh, doping is a process which increases the conductivity of silicon. Um, so very few of the silicon atoms are replaced by other atoms, such as arsenic, which is another semiconductor, um, which increases that conductivity. So that's how they make our electronics work faster and better as we get through technology um, section of this. Uh, there's two main types of semiconductor. The N stands for negative, and that means the uh, atom is substituted for silicon has more valence electrons than silicon, uh, and the extra electrons are free to move throughout the structure to help it conduct electricity. Uh, silicon with a few arsenic atoms makes an N-type conductor, and there's you a picture of that. The next type is a P-type, which is P for positive, and of course, if you could guess, it's the opposite. It has fewer electrons. So an example of that would be boron. So this creates basically kind of a hole where the electri ele missing electron would be, and then they can use that to travel through the structure uh, to be able to conduct electricity. And so here's what that looks like. Uh, molecular solids, things like ice, dry ice, uh, sulfur, which is a polyatomic ion, usually we represent that as S8, and phosphorus, also a polyatomic, and we represent that as P4. Uh, it's strong covalent bonding within the molecules, but relatively weak forces between the molecules. So it's inter-molecular uh, bonding, no, it's, excuse me, it's intra between the molecules is strong, but the intermolecular forces between the molecules is not very strong. So the atoms within the molecules are closer to each other uh, than the atoms of the adjacent. So this indicates stronger bonding. CO2, S8, I2 all have no dipole-dipole forces because they are nonpolar. So the last three are solids at room temperature because of the London dispersion forces. CO2, of course, is not. Um, but remember, more electrons means it's more polariz polarizable, or you could have it say it has more polarizability, has the ability to form stronger London dispersion forces because more electrons mean more induced dipoles. Um, that brings us to ionic solids, which is uh, the stable. They have high melting points. 
and they're held together by strong electrostatic uh, or coulombic forces. The smaller the ion, usually the cations, fit into the holes between the larger. Attractions are maximized and repulsions are minimized. Uh, vapor pressure and changes in state. Okay, uh, vaporiza Vaporization or evaporation is uh, an endothermic process. Remember, we have to absorb energy because we have to break the intermolecular bonding. So when water boils, we have to break those hydrogen bonds between the water molecules. So that requires energy, so it's an endothermic process. The heat of vaporization is the energy required to vaporize one mole of a liquid. Um, so if you have a high intermolecular force, you're going to have a high heat of vaporization or a high boiling point. Um, evaporation is a cooling process. Condensation is by the difference between evaporation and condensation is for they're basically the opposite, right? So if condensation is when the water molecules reform, what does it need to do to be able to do that? It needs to release energy. So here is a dynamic process between the rate of condensation and the rate of vaporization. So the molecules are released into the air and then they're swarming around, but then they also will recondense. Re and of course, you get to that equilibrium vapor pressure uh, at which time they're both the same amount of molecules are vaporizing and condensing. Uh, the vapor pressure of a vapor present at equilibrium is measured by a bar barometer, and usually that's a mercury column, and so the vapor pressure is equal to the atmosphere minus uh, the pressure of the atmosphere minus the pressure in the uh, mercury column. If something is volatile, here's another one of those definitions, it means it has a propensity to evaporate very rapidly. So gasoline has a high volatility. As an example of that, water is not very volatile. Uh, the vapor pressure is affected by two factors. One, molar mass. Um, at a given temperature, heavy molecules have lower velocities, so they're less likely to escape from the liquid surface. So a liquid with a high molar mass tends to have a low vapor pressure. High molar mass, low vapor pressure. Also, the intermolecular forces, of course, um, would make a difference. If you have a high IMF, you're going to have a low vapor pressure. So that will go back to water. Water has a high intermolecular force because it has hydrogen bonding. Uh, things like acetone, which is in fingernail polish remover, has a uh, much lower intermolecular forces, so it has a higher vapor pressure and it's more volatile, so it evaporates much quicker. And so here is some examples of that. We've got water vapor, we've got uh, ethanol, and acetone vapor. So acetone is going to have a uh, higher volatility because it doesn't have hydrogen bonding, whereas alcohol does have hydrogen bonding. Not as much as in water, that's why it's got a, um, a higher vapor pressure. So here we have vapor pressure increasing with temperature because, remember, Heat them up, speed them up, and that means higher kinetic energy, um, but it is not a direct relationship. You do not need to be able to solve vapor pressure temperature problems for the AP exam. As temperature increases, the average kinetic energy increases, and so more particles um, have enough energy to vaporize, which makes sense. That's just counterintuitive. That's just intuitive. And then here we have the temperature, inverse temperature on the uh, right side. Uh, sublimation is when we go directly from a solid to a gas. Uh, dry ice uh, is an example of that. And so when I put dry ice out on the counter, it goes straight to the gas. It just skips the liquid phase altogether. Uh, heating curve is the plot of the temperature versus time for a process where energy is added at a constant rate. So it looks like that. You've seen that in Chem 1. Um, so it looks, and of course, when you're looking at uh, these phase changes themselves, the temperature is constant. Temperature constant at phase change. So you might want to write that down at phase change. Uh, 
Um, heat effusion is another definition. It is the enthalpy change that occurs when a solid melts. Again, high IMF, high heat effusion. Uh, temperature remains constant as phase changes. Uh, below zero degrees Celsius, the vapor pressure of ice is less than the vapor pressure of liquid water. The normal melting point is the temperature at which the solid and the liquid have the same vapor pressure at one atmosphere. So that's um, what you need to know about that. Normal melting point is the melting point at one at atmosphere. And again, high IMF, high melting point. Uh, boiling occurs when the vapor pressure of the liquid is equal to the external pressure. Again, normal boiling point is the temperature at which the vapor pressure is exactly one atmosphere. And I think that's where I want to stop the lesson for today. We'll do those calculations next time.